How do you feel? Good. Fantastic. I mean, it doesn't hurt. It just makes me cry. Yeah. Like a love song. <laughs> <laughs> she said, what can you do to this face? She said, I've been to 56 and a half doctors and modeling agents. And they all told me, well, the modeling agent said I'm too perfect for this agency. And the doctor said, you're just too good. I can't do anything. So she came here to see if I can step up my game a little and actually make something better on this already good face. And so I told her, no, I can't, but I can play with your face. So what we're going to do is make the face look a little bit softer, a little bit more refreshed uh, here on the under eye and the anterior cheek smile. You can see it's a little flattened here across the fat pads on the, size of, uh, on the side of the nose, which I call them the nasal fat pads, but it's a superficial malar fat pad and there's a nasal component to it there. Smile big. There you go, relax. You can see it's a little flattened there. A little bit hollow under here, so we're gonna volumize her just with a touch of filler. If you look around the chin, we're gonna put a little bit of Botox because when she talks, this tends to kind of pull up a little bit. She's getting a deeper crease here in the sulcus mentalis. I'm going to put a thought of filler there and there and give her a little bit of cheek contour. This is somebody who you might look at and say you'd want to do filler here or there. I would say not because her face looks great like this. Uh, little tiny imperfections like that don't matter. When you add volume to somebody's face, there's always the risk of it getting full and she has a very delicate, thin, slim face. I don't want to make her look full. You don't want to mess up a face that looks like this. So right now we're going to start with the under eye. It's always nice to start with the under eye because it gives you a nice idea of what you can do with the cheek next. And the under eye is the area that can lift the nasolabial fold. So the first part that we do is a little injection to this area on a diagonal called the malar septum. If you look, there's an indent on everybody's cheek. Malar septum, it's a natural cleavage plane. It makes it very easy to enter into that plane and pass a cannula. So we're using a cannula. A cannula is a blunt tipped needle. So the hole on it is here off the side. And if you touch it with your finger, it's not sharp, it's blunt. It's like a ball tip. And the filler comes out the side of it like that. So what we're gonna do is put it into this little hole right over here. Spin as you go in, makes it easy to pop in like that. Now, I'm gonna tell her beforehand, you're gonna feel pressure. You feel my finger right here? Mm -hmm. You're gonna feel pressure where my finger is. This is gonna travel all the way up there, okay? So, benefits of cannula are tremendous for the under eye. So I'm right on the bone. Look up to the sky, perfect. So I'm feeling right under my finger, which is all the way in front of the anterior portion of the orbital rim. So you're actually on the rim, right in front of it, depositing right onto where the periosteum is, which is called the SUF, the suborbicularis oculi fat pad. So that fat pad is attached to the bone at the orbital rim, extends down the cheek, and that's what we're integrating our filler into. So we're doing very small aliquots. We don't want to do a lot in one place because it can congeal. Now, we always start right in the middle. We w work our way outwards and inwards. As we get to this middle third here, there's a muscle that comes down called the orbicularis ligament, orbicularis sling. It's where the orbicularis muscle adheres onto the bone. You do not want to inject sub, uh, super periosteal here. You want to go superficial here. Sorry about that. A little reflexed here. So here we want to go actually superficial just on that medial portion. So now we're starting the other side. We made a little needle hole right over here. We're gonna slide our tip right into it like this, just the tip, mm -hmm. and we spin it and it goes in. So, put my finger right over here on the orbital rim. Get a little bump there from something, not sure what it is, but we will work our way around it. So I tell them always, you're gonna feel my finger right there. You're gonna feel pressure coming under my finger. That way, they're not as shocked or surprised when something ends up over there from a needle hole over here. So, as we go medial, we still say a little bit deep, and then as we go really medial, we become superficial. All right, so this side corrected much more easily than the other side. However, she has a flatter lower cheek on this side. Nobody is symmetric. You should never try to treat them symmetrically, nor expect a fully symmetric result. So now we're up on the side. The key up here is that the lateral fat pad and the lateral orbital septum actually attach onto a ridge over here on the bone. 
if you inject into the periosteum there, you will actually inject it into the orbit and it'll make a big fat pad, fat pad bulge. So when we're up here on the corner, we're going up and we're making sure that we are a micrometer or half a millimeter above the periosteum. And that's how we're feeling that right now. And I'm feeling half by palpation, half by visualization. Something to be aware of for these areas. It does help to actually feel the filler go into the areas that you think are void of volume. So there, so she's already corrected there. You don't need to put much else. You always massage to it. smooth it out and disperse the filler, which is what it's doing. Remember, these are gel beads. And now we're gonna go to that flattened nasal fat pad she has. So I pop back in, go right here to the side. Again, this is an area that has high risk of vascular occlusion and ischemia. So you have to make sure you're loose in there. Okay, nice and loose. And we're gonna do one or two cc's, massage it in, one or two cc's, making sure it stays in the fat pad, not going into the orbicularis ligament that we talked about. Now you look softer. Little dot in the infrapupillary under eye. And we're golden. Okay, so right now we're injecting this area on the chin. She has something very minor, a very minor version of powder orange or orange peel or hyper contracture of the mentalis muscle. So go like this, these little guys. So we're just weakening those a touch. So you put very small amounts. The thing to know about powder orange or orange peel or hyper contracture of the mentalis is that it typically happens all around the chin and you get a deeper sulcus mentalis and two depressions on the side here. You could also get depressor anguli oris hypercontracture. Typically happens because of the position of the lower teeth compared to the chin or the upper teeth compared to the lip. That's why it happens. So over time it starts to wrinkle here and the chin starts to get into a higher position. That's why if you look at it from the side, the ball of her chin, instead of being angulated down here where it naturally was, is up a couple millimeters. So it focuses right there. Her muscle tone is always pulling it up. It happens with people with prominent teeth, small chin or prominent upper lower teeth or small upper lips. Anything that has to uh, give some force from the lower lip to get your mouth to close. So relaxing, we put some Botox right here superficially into the mentalis right next to the skin. If you go above this halfway mark into this area, you can easily affect the movement of the mouth and people hate it. If you stay on the halfway mark of the chin right here and down, you're safe. These over here are bunny lines. Smile really big, wrinkle your nose. There you go, those guys. You can hit here on the side of the nose in the nasalis muscle and relax it. If you go here, you can hit the levator aliquid nasi, which is the one that lifts the corner of the mouth. Turn over this way. So we're just doing the tiniest little injections there and it'll soften that. I typically do that injection when I'm doing the rest of the crow's feet around the face. Last part, very easy. Takes but a few seconds. We're gonna do a little bit of cheek contour. Lauren's been my friend for a while now. She's not one to actually put much makeup on. So it's nice if we can just give her a little bit of contour on the cheek. She's not an over makeup -y person. So when looking at the face, you have to keep the bony and soft tissue in a balance with each other. Okay, you don't wanna make someone too bony. You don't wanna make someone too anterior cheeky, you want to balance. The teeth are a part of that, the eyes are a part of that, and the skeletal structures that you see on the face are all a part of that. When you're doing a lateral cheek here, that's considered one of the skeletal features. So for her, if I build it out a lot, she has a thin face, it's gonna make her look bony. I could do just a little bit, right here on the malar flat, which is where the masseter inserts. So that's the top portion of where the masseter inserts is a flat little portion there. I go down right onto the bone. This is using Restylane Lift. Uh, the two that are really, really nice over here are Restylane Lift and Voluma. The reason I use Restylane Lift mostly is just a cost factor. When you're looking between Voluma and Restylane Lift, you get one and a half times as much volume for something that lasts almost as long on Restylane Lift. But they're both very good products for this because they're rigid and resilient. 
So all she needs is a little tiny bit. When you build up the cheek over here, you look at the lateral contour, you look at the cheek contour coming down because you're supposed to form kind of a triangle like this, and then you follow the zygomatic arch back this way. The mistake I see from more novice injectors is they go that way. They think that it goes here. You need a slight temporal depression coming out to the contour of the cheek back into a lateral depression on the cheek. That's a natural contour that people like to see and it follows the natural skeletal prominences that we have and it's draped and kind of softened by the soft tissue. So for her, that's pretty much adequate on that side. She doesn't really need much. Right here, she's missing the smallest amount of contour. That's an area that bruises a lot because there's a transverse facial vessel coming out of there. So I don't hit it. I either go from the front of it or from behind it. I'm right-handed, so I gotta flip myself over this way a little bit. I'm gonna use the same hole right there, go back down, go down towards the bone. And I'm just popping out that little part right there and that worked easily. So that continued her inferior portion a little bit. Great. Okay, can I have you hold that? Thank you, not too hard. Now we do the other side. So again, we feel for that flat right there. That's the malar flat. That's where the masseter inserts across the face onto the cheek. We go right there, put our hand around it, squeeze as we go in. I usually have my hand around it like this so I can feel where it's going because this can travel as you're injecting it. So you better feel where it's going. So that did a perfect job there. I relax and she needs a little touch right above it, right there. Perfect. And now I'm gonna reach back and go towards the zygomatic arch. Perfect. A little bit I needed over here on the other side, right? And I'm just gonna do a touch on the zygomatic arch. So you have to pinch around the arch, hold it, and inject right onto it, just like that. Now she has that little bit of accent. You massage it in to make sure it's all smooth, just like that. Now we take a look at the face all together. And you see everything is matchy matchy. Yep. So the way I look at the cheeks, I always follow the contour of the cheek up, make sure that it has a nice gentle depression as it comes up to the temples. Uh, most people are overfilling the temples, it makes the head look wide or it makes the cheek look tall, it looks weird. So that for her is perfect. Delicate face, keep it delicate. You never want to take somebody in the wrong direction and don't ever think that doing fillers now is not going to affect them in the future. It can carry water, it can expand the skin, it can do a lot of things. So somebody who looks like this, you don't ever want to mess that up. And you can see now. Oh wow. Oh, hello. Hello. <laughs> It looks awesome. Very natural. I love it. Yay. You're the best. Afterwards, we take a look at everything. We wipe it gently. We tell them the Botox, or in this case, Dysport. I don't use Botox so much. I use Dysport. It's going to kick in within about two days starting, but two weeks it settles. The instructions afterwards, and this is important to know, there's a lot of voodoo out there that makes no sense. So, Botox, your instructions. For three hours, just don't go aggressively rub your face or exercise. Three hours, that's it. After that, it's set, and nothing else can go wrong with it. When people say you can't lay down, that's a mistake. You can lay down, just don't go rubbing your face in the pillow. If you lay on your back, it's actually probably less risky than if you're walking around. So they just worry about migration. So all of that is voodoo. It's not really real. And as far as the thermos go, uh, you shouldn't really be massaging it when you go home because it's a gel that can move. And I place it in certain areas, and I don't want you to touch it. Um, if anybody tells you to massage it, you can go ahead and do it, but in this case, where I placed it very precisely in certain areas, I don't want you touching. In a couple of days, if there's any bumps anywhere, you can massage those. And that's really it. Now you just wait for everything to settle in. You're not going to get any bruises from this because we use cannulas here. We're very careful over here. If anywhere bruises, it's usually the lower face. If you get that, you really just try to take arnica, bromelain, and that kind of stuff. That's it. Easy peasy, please, please.